Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. Today we want to focus attention on the book of Colossians, um, a, one of Paul's books to a group of people that he really didn't initially minister to or do a church plant uh, with. Um, and we have with us um, Adam Copenhaver, a uh, pastor of Ma Mapton uh, Grace Brethren Church in Washington State with us to um, walk us through the book of Colossians to introduce us to this book. Adam, welcome. Thanks, Herb. Glad to be here. Um, let's let's uh, let's get right to uh, let's get right to our, our topic, uh, the book of Colossians. Um, what might you say is the the big picture of Colossians, or the the, the big overriding theme that's that's driving uh, this this letter? Yeah, it's a good question because Colossians is a very rich book with a number of themes, and so it's it's kind of tricky to sift out what the key theme is. But what's interesting about Colossians is kind of like Ephesians, it's, it's broken into two halves with an imperative in the middle, and that imperative kind of gives the theme. So in Ephesians, you classically have six chapters divided in half, three on either side of this instruction to walk worthy of the calling you've received in Ephesians 4.1. And it's not quite as obvious as in Ephesians, but there's something similar in Colossians, where in the first chapter and a half or so, there's a number of theological themes that, that develop. And then you have a key command in chapter 2, verse, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him. And that's the first imperative of the letter. <clears throat> excuse me, the first command of the letter. And then that begins playing out in chapters 2, 3, and 4 with these instructions of walking in Christ. And so... The key theme of the letter is walking in Christ, but then I like to add the word together. It's walking together in Christ because we see as that idea of walking in Christ unfolds that this is a community project for the church to undertake together, and that becomes a very important theme. So, so walking together in Christ is a, is a central theme to the letter of Colossians. Okay. Um, when you think about... Uh, uh, any book in the New Testament, any letter, particularly of Paul, um, though there may be a central theme, as you've articulated and identified in um, Colossians, what might you say be some major theological themes? I'm going to ask to limit you to three. There's probably uh, many that you might be able to uh, point to. But um, what might you tell me uh, about the three major theological themes that, that uh, Paul appears to um, be concerned about? Yeah, Colossians is rich with theological themes. It's one of the things that makes it a fantastic book to study and to preach. One of the themes it's most well known for, and for very good reason, is its high Christology. Colossians presents a very exalted picture of Christ. That comes out especially in the first chapter, right, right at the beginning of the letter. Paul begins with his thanksgiving for the Colossians, where he's speaking of his relationship to them, of the reports he's heard. He's grateful for them. He he then prays for the Colossians, and then he just, in his prayer, he just drifts and breaks out into a, a hymn celebrating the exalted Christ in verses 15 through 20 of chapter 1. <clears throat> so we get this very exalted portrait of, of Christ as the one in whom and by whom and through whom all things were created and how he's the head of all things and all things are held together in him. And then the hymn turns toward Christ's work in redemption and how he how he has died and how he's been raised as the first fruit, the first of all that will be raised, and how he's made peace through all, with all things through the blood of the cross. So, so the hymn really portrays Christ in very exalted terms, so very high Christology. And then that permeates the rest of the letter. The hymn resurfaces in very subtle ways throughout, throughout the letter, and that Christology resurfaces. So that would be the first very important theme, that, that Colossians gives us a very exalted portrait of Christ. Then a second theme that's very interesting in connection to that first theme is that Colossians also develops the idea of our union with Christ. We have this exalted Christ. Then Paul says in the end of chapter 1 that there's this profound mystery that he has received and been stewarded with as an apostle that he now makes known, which is the mystery of Christ in you. And then he unpackages that in chapter 2 where he says that you have been filled in Christ, and then he 
He says, you've been circumcised with the circumcision of Christ. You've been circumcised in Christ, which I take as a metaphor of dying in Christ. And then he says, in baptism, you've been buried with Christ and raised with Christ. And so we have the work of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And you've been united to Christ in that work. And then he, in chapter 3, you've been raised with Christ. So think about the things above where Christ is seated. So all this in Christ language that, that takes the believer and connects us very intricately with Christ, where his work is, has been applied to us and we've received his work and so forth. Very mystical, very mysterious to think about, but this, of this idea of union with Christ and of, of our position as believers in Christ. So we have an exalted Christ, In the Christology, we have union with Christ. And then a third theme that flows into the letter, especially in the later part of the letter, is the idea of the body of Christ. It kind of comes out in the hymn that he is the head of the church, Hmm. uh, the head of the body, which is the church. It comes out a little later in the letter, but then by the time we get to the third chapter especially, um, Paul's really focused in on, on this idea of the body of Christ and what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And that it's and then Paul develops our our unity as believers within the body of Christ by saying in chapter three there's only one body, the body of Christ, and that's why in the body we have to forgive one another, we have to bear together, we have to figure out how to make it work with other believers in the body of Christ because it's not just me that was united to Christ, you were united to Christ, and he was united to Christ, and she was united to Christ, and it doesn't matter if. They're Greek or Jew or circumcised, uncircumcised, slave, free, all now together united in Christ, in the body of Christ. So high Christology, each believer is united to Christ, but then we are united to Christ together, and we live this out together and figure it out together. Well, uh, what a profound book. Absolutely. Uh, And it's only four chapters, and all that in just four chapters. And more. And more. (laughs) Well, let me let me uh, let's uh, uh, let me ask this question: What's driven Paul to write this letter? What's the what's this historical backdrop to this letter that would uh, would cause him to want to pause and write such a uh, an enriching uh, letter? Uh, what, 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 what might what might you tell me about that? What a fantastic question! <laughs> <laughs> there. There are some various ideas surrounding the historical situation. And we can begin with with what we know Paul says in the letter itself. He starts right off by giving thanks to the Colossians, and he speaks of a report that he has heard, that Epaphras has come to Paul and reported to Paul about the good things that are happening in Colossae. And Epaphras was apparently the person who had traveled to Colossae, which was just a little little town, little remote town out by Laodicea and Hierapolis. And, and Epaphras had taken the gospel there, apparently, and, and the gospel had borne fruit. It had been received. It had been, the Colossians had received it with faith, and now it's bearing fruit among them. And Epaphras has returned to Paul with this report. Now, that in and of itself might lead Paul to, to pen a nice, warm letter. But there's also some other issues that surface in the book that, that perhaps suggest that there was a little more than just good things going on in Colossae. Maybe there were also some struggles. And so a lot of commentaries especially focus in on the second chapter of Colossians where Paul gives some warnings about not being taken captive by a philosophy or by empty rhetoric. And then he gives some, gets more and more specific throughout the chapter about the nature of what others might use to judge the Colossians. So there, there's a possibility that there was some kind of false teaching going around in Colossae. Well, there's some debate about what that might have looked like, but that might have been a piece to Paul's concern. But then what I find even more fascinating than that is that uh, we find something kind of surprising when we get to the very end of the letter in chapter 4 when Paul acknowledges the letter carriers who are taking the letter to Colossae. And he identifies Tychicus as one of those letter carriers. And then with Tychicus is this guy Onesimus. And Paul says of Tychicus, he's my, he's my dear brother, and he's my fellow servant or slave mm. with Tychicus. Then he says of Onesimus, he's my fellow brother, but he doesn't use the word slave. And so then we know, of course, of Onesimus through the letter to Philemon, which is very closely connected. And we know that 
Onesimus was this slave who had run into issues with Philemon, perhaps having robbed him or something of that nature, and had run away and had come to Paul and had then come to Christ and had become valuable to Paul and was sent back to Philemon. So it's possible that the letter to Colossians is being sent back to Colossae at the same time as the letter to Philemon, and that Philemon is a member of this church in Colossae. It's possible Colossians was sent at a later time, but either way, the situation with um, Onesimus and Philemon, we know that's a part of the, of the DNA of the church in Colossae. We know that there are two Christians, we know of two Christians by name who are in Colossae, Onesimus and Philemon. We know one is a slave, one is his slave master. We know that the slave has wronged the slave master, and they're in the church together. And so when we get to the third chapter of Colossians, when Paul starts talking about forgiving one another and bearing with one another and so on, we can very vividly imagine what Paul is anticipating and, and expecting and even demanding of Onesimus and Philemon and how they're to function in the church. So I like to think that perhaps what, what Colossians is doing and the reason Paul has taken up his quill is to try to give the church at Colossae and especially Onesimus and Philemon the theological foundation they need to make life work together in Christ in this church so that there's one church in Colossae and they're both part of it. Hmm. All right. Uh, let's, uh, having gotten a, a feel for the, the driving overall overarching purpose of the book and, and some major theological themes and, the, and that historical backdrop that's driving Paul to write this, how might you recommend to a pastor or a teacher to go about teaching through the book of Colossians? Yeah, there, there are some different um, strategies for it. I've preached through the book of Colossians, okay. um, as well as done some other academic study and writing on it, and then also preached through it in, in my congregation. And there are, of course, preaching through Colossians, there are a number of theological themes to explore. Um, I took some time to, uh, with, the, with the Christology especially and the Christ hymn to make sure people understand the Christology and so on. But what I found especially helpful was taking that historical backdrop of Onesimus and Philemon. That, that is a, a scenario that people can get their minds around. Mm. Everybody can identify with not getting along with someone in the church. Everyone can identify with being sinned against in the church or being hurt in the church. And so that, that gives the real practical thrust to it. We can talk about the high Christology but then we connect, can connect it to a very real situation and how that Christology allows us to function in the church and guides how we function in the church. And so I tried, when I preached, I tried to make sure people knew the story of Philemon and Onesimus early on. So then throughout the sermon series, we could refer to that. And that was a, a step toward application on several different points throughout um, the sermon series to make it practical. And then also knowing my own congregation and knowing the issues at work in my congregation, there were some points where we traveled in, in fifth gear and just kind of raced along pretty quickly through some of the warnings in chapter two and so on. Then when we got to chapter three, we dropped it all the way down in the first gear and we just crawled through and took our time to really unpackage the instructions for church life in chapter three and into chapter four. So. So almost one verse a week mm. for a little while in there. So that was just a pastoral decision about what I thought would be most, most helpful and relevant to our church. And then the other little thing that we did is I made sure people knew that Paul intended this letter to be read as a whole. The letter carriers showed up in Colossae and they read it in one, one reading and maybe read it multiple times, but they didn't read one verse a week for 20 weeks or something like that. And so we started off with an introduction and then I read the whole letter to Colossians to the church. That was a little new, but by the time we got through the book of Colossians and got to the end, we, we did the same thing again. We had four elders in our church on our board at that time, and so four chapters in Colossians. Each of them came up and read one chapter, one right after the other, hmm. to end the series, and people had an idea of what Colossians is about and heard it. And So I got some really good feedback from that. They'd never sat and endured four chapters being read at one time before, but wow, was that helpful. 
yeah. when they have an understanding of the letter. So, so there's at least a few a few tips and probably many more, but that's a start of okay. the preaching it. Well, very good. Well, when you when you sat down and you uh, uh, began your work in Colossians, um, I know you have a book uh, uh, translating uh, the book of Colossians clause by clause um, that you've done and um, uh, probably supplemented uh, your uh, initial studies. Um, what other books did you use uh, to um, uh, prepare yourself for preaching in Colossians? What commentaries, what were some helpful, what might be some helpful w sources besides your translating Jew, uh, Colossians clause by clause, what might be some other helpful sources you might recommend? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of helpful resources. Colossians is such a rich book that there's been a lot written on it, and there are a lot of really good commentaries out there on the book. The, the, the couple of commentaries that I recommend is at least a starting point. Uh, one is by um, N.T. Wright. It's a little, little volume in the Tyndale um, New Testament commentary series, um, a commentary on Colossians and Philemon. And that's a, that's a good introductory commentary. It's short, it's pretty reliable, and does a good job um, being very brief, but walking through the major themes of the letter and the, the major issues. And then a more expanded commentary by Doug Moo in the Pillar um, commentary series. And he does a really good job of Colossians and Philemon again together. Um, but he's a little more thorough, takes his time to look at some various views on different things and to explore them and to weigh the options, but very reasonable in the conclusions that he makes. So, so Moo does a very good job as well. So those are, those are two good commentaries. If I, if I was a pastor and I'm reading the text and thinking about it and translating, working through in the Greek, if I'm able to do that, and then those would be the first two commentaries I'd read and then, and then maybe branch out from there if I wanted to or if I had the time to do that. Okay. Adam, thank you so much for joining with us. Yeah, thanks. It's been a pleasure to be here. Well, good. And I'm happy to talk about Colossians anytime somebody wants to. <laughs> well, and you can tell, uh, you've, you've got that book, uh, that letter, the Paul's letter, uh, a good uh, grip and handle around it. And I thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And thank you for joining us. And I, I trust that uh, this might be a, a, um, a book you might consider um, um, studying, teach, preach sometime in the future. It's a great letter, and I trust that um, you'll, you'll pick it up and read it and, and um, maybe do some extended study of your own. But in the meantime, I trust that you will have a great day and that you will walk with the King and be a blessing. <laughs>